The enthalpy of a system is the sum of the internal energy, E, and the product of the pressure and volume, PV. So internal energy plus P times V, pr plus pressure times volume. The change in enthalpy is defined as the change in energy plus the pressure times the change in volume. Or it's also defined as the heat of reaction at constant pressure. So delta H and delta E are generally similar in value. The E, remember, is the internal energy, which is the sum of all potential and kinetic energy inside the sample. And generally, E and H, the enthalpy, are similar in value. So H is kind of like the internal energy. It's kind of like the sum of all of the potential and kinetic energy. Um, but it also has this other component, P uh, plus P times delta V, which is similar to work. So at constant pressure, if there's a volume change, then we'll have uh, some uh, value over here, which will make H a little bit bigger than delta E. So enthalpy is a state function. And what that means is a state function is one where um, Regardless of how you calculate it, it doesn't matter which path you take to get from point A to point C, um, if the, the value of enthalpy is always going to be the same. So um, the one analogy is um, a, alti a change in altitude is a state function. So it only depends on the difference between the initial and final values, not on the path taken. So if we're looking at the change in altitude here on this mountain, the change in altitude is 10,000 feet. So if you go from the bottom and you go to the top, you have changed altitude. You've changed 10,000 feet in altitude. But if you go straight up the side of the mountain, you haven't walked as far, five miles. And if you take this path and you go zigzag all the way up the mountain, you've walked more than twice as, as far. So the distance that you've walked is not a state function. That's a path function. So depending on the path, that's going to be different. The distance is different. Path A and path B have a different distance. But path A and path B have traveled the same altitude distance. Once you get to the top, you've gone 10,000 feet. So a state function is one that the value does not change depending on the path. And a path function is one where the value does change depending on the path. So enthalpy is a state function. Enthalpy is more like altitude. It doesn't matter how we get there. The enthalpy, the change in enthalpy for a system is always the same, regardless of which path we take. We'll see more about what that means when we um, get to some example problems here in a minute. So um, delta H enthalpy equals heat at constant pressure. So delta H equals Q. And remember, Q is heat. And heat is when thermal energy is transferred during a reaction. It can either be released, and when thermal energy is released during a reaction, then the reaction heats up, the particles start to go faster, or thermal energy can be absorbed, um, in which case the particles in the surroundings cool down, they get colder, and they start to go slower, the particles move slower. So when delta H is negative, that means that heat has been released, um, then we call that an exothermic reaction. And when delta H, the change in enthalpy, is positive, or Q is positive, then that means that heat is being absorbed, and that's an endothermic reaction. So when delta H is negative or Q is negative, heat is being released. That's exothermic, it heats up. When delta H is positive or Q is positive, that means that heat is being absorbed by the system, and that's endothermic. That means that the surroundings get cold. So here, this is called a reaction energy diagram. This shows us uh, in a diagram representation what we just talked about in terms of the heat being absorbed or released. So here, this is the reaction progress. So what we mean by reaction progress is I put A over here and B over here. A goes to B. A goes to B. Reactants on this side, A. Products on this side, B. 
So on this axis, this is the potential energy. So um, sometimes the potential energy that we're measuring is H. In this case, we're talking about enthalpy. So we'll put H over here. So when the reactants are turning into products, when A goes to B, in this case, we see A going to B makes the, the products have more potential energy than the reactants. Here is the potential energy of the reactants. Here is the potential energy of the products. So the, the products have more potential energy than the reactants. Over here on this diagram, we can see that the reactants here have more potential energy than the products down here. So in this case, when the reactants have, when the products have more energy than the reactants, then what happened during this reaction? Well, the system gained energy. If it gained energy and energy is being absorbed, then this is endothermic. On this one, we see when A goes to B, the reactants goes to products. Well, products have less energy than the reactants. The energy is going down. So then energy must be released by the system. That this energy right here, this difference delta H, this energy is being released by the system, being released as heat. So when it's being released, we call this exothermic. So here, this delta H, this value right here, is being released as heat. And in this case right here, this delta H, well, that energy, this system is absorbing energy. Where is the energy coming from? Well, it's coming from the surroundings. So this, this these are the surroundings. This is the system. This is the system. Outside of the system are the surroundings. So in an endothermic reaction, the, rea the system gains energy. The energy goes up. If the, energy, if the system is gaining energy, where does that energy come from? It comes from the surroundings. So the energy comes from the surroundings and it goes into the system and it makes the energy go up. When the energy comes from the surroundings, when it comes out of the surroundings, the surroundings get colder because that energy is heat. So the energy that goes into the system to make this energy go up is heat that comes from the surroundings. So the surroundings get colder. So in an endothermic reaction, the, su the surroundings get cold. In an exothermic reaction, A goes to B, the energy goes down. The reactants going to products, the energy is released. As the energy goes down, where does it go if it's released? Well, it gets released into the surroundings as heat. So if energy is being released from the system into the surroundings as heat, what happens to the surroundings? They get hot, they heat up. So if you're holding a reaction that's exothermic, it will heat up. If you're holding a reaction that's endothermic, it will cool down. So one example is um, these instant cold ice packs. If you've ever had one of these, maybe if you're an athlete, you're familiar with these. Um, sometimes when you're uh, an athlete and you get injured and you're at a game and maybe there's not a lot of ice nearby, there's not an ice machine, well, these instant cold packs can act just like ice. They're not cold when you have them stored. But then when you break the barrier inside and you mix the chemical reactants inside of the bag, a chemical reaction happens and the bag gets cold really, really fast. It, it is as though it freezes instantly. So the reason that that happens is because one of the reactants inside the bag is water and one of the reactants inside the bag is a powder. And when you mix that powder with the water, the, the powder, uh, the ions in the powder separate. The plus and the minus separates. That's what, that's what happens when you dissolve something, right? We have plus and minus pulling apart when I dissolve an ion in water. So plus and minus pulling apart takes energy. 
because plus and minus are stuck together like magnets. So in order to pull apart the plus and the minus in some powders, in some ionic compounds, when they dissolve in water, it takes a lot of energy to pull those pluses and minuses apart. So dissolving some substances makes that solution get really cold because in order to pull the ions apart, it needs heat. It takes heat from the surroundings and the surroundings get cold. So an exothermic reaction is um, the, the, like an instant hot pack. If you, maybe if you've ever gone skiing or if you've gone hunting or something and it's really cold and you use these hand warmers or foot warmers and they're a little pack that when it's stored it's not hot but as soon as you open uh, the, the packet and you um, expose the packet to air then it starts to heat up. So in that case the reactants are some chemical compound uh, that is without oxygen and the other reactant is oxygen. So when oxygen touches the powder that's inside of the instant hot pack, a chemical reaction occurs and the oxygen bonds to, a bond is created with the oxygen and the powder inside and when that happens, heat is released. And so when heat is released, when that bond is formed, then it gets hot. So you see the difference here is that when something is dissolving, it has to get pulled apart. So a bond is broken. Plus and minus are separated. Plus and minus getting separated is breaking a bond. That takes energy. So it takes energy from the surroundings and it gets cold. The energy has to go in to break the bond. Here, a bond is made. There's some powder. Oxygen comes in from the air and it touches the powder and oxygen makes a bond with the powder. A bond is made. Energy is released. So when bonds are broken, energy is absorbed, and when bonds are formed, energy is released. So in an exothermic reaction, um, what the energy that comes that, that's released, an exothermic reaction gets hot, energy is released. Where does that energy come from? Well, it's trapped inside the bond. A bond is like a spring. Like you imagine a, a chemical is like two bowling balls, those are the atoms, and a bond is like a spring that holds together two bowling balls. So it kind of vibrates a little bit. And there's energy inside of a spring, right? If you compress a spring and you uh, release it, then it can have energy stored inside of it. So just like a spring has energy stored inside of it if you compress it, a chemical bond has energy stored inside of it based on the two nuclei, the two cannonballs, bowling balls that are on either side of the spring. So when that bond, uh, in order to, to break that bond, in order to take those chemicals apart, then they um, energy has to go in in order to break those chemicals apart. So this part is a little bit counterintuitive because yes, there is energy stored inside of a bond. And so sometimes people think that when you break a bond, you get that energy out. But that's not exactly what's happening. To break a bond, to pull those atoms apart, then you need to put energy in. You can imagine two magnets stuck together. If you have two magnets stuck together, they don't blow apart automatically. In order to get two magnets separated, you have to pull them apart. You have to put energy into the system to pull them apart. So breaking magnets apart, breaking a bond, takes energy. You have to pull them apart. But when they're pulled apart, they have uh, energy that the particles themselves before their bond before they make a new bond they have energy and when they find another partner to make a new bond with then that extra energy can be released so the particles themselves have the energy when they're separated and then when they come together to make a new bond then the energy can be released and that's an exothermic reaction so in exothermic reactions bonds are uh, more energy is released when bonds are formed and in an endothermic reaction more energy is absorbed when bonds are broken. So the enthalpy change in a reaction is an extensive property and remember extensive means that it's different um, depending on how much stuff you have. So mass is different depending on how much stuff you have. If I have a small glass of water and a big glass of water the mass is different. But if I have a small glass of water and a big glass of water from the same tap, then the temperature is not different. So temperature doesn't matter, doesn't change 
doesn't depend on how much material I have, but mass does depend on how much material I have. Well, enthalpy change does depend on how much material I have. The more material we have, the more heat will be released. If your heat pack, your instant hot pack is bigger, it gets hotter. If your instant hot pack is smaller, it doesn't get as hot. So the amount of stuff you have changes the amount of enthalpy. Um, so for example, um, when we're talking about enthalpy, we usually talk about uh, the enthalpy of the whole reaction. So here's a reaction. Propane plus oxygen makes carbon dioxide plus water. And when I have one mole of this propane undergoing this reaction right here, so one mole of this, five moles of this, three moles of this, and four moles of this, then the heat that's associated with that is negative 2,044 kilojoules. So remember, when it's negative, that means that it's being released. So delta H negative, heat is being released. That means this is exothermic, this heat is being released. So we say that for one mole of C3H8, it releases negative 2,044 kilojoules. But we can also say in this reaction that for every five moles of O2, it releases the same amount, negative 2,044 kilojoules. For every three moles of CO2 made in this reaction, 2,044 kilojoules is released. For every four moles of water made in this reaction, 2,044 kilojoules is released. So this number, the delta H of reaction, is associated with all of these values. It's for every one mole of this, for every five moles of this, for every three moles of this, and for every four moles of this, I get this number. Um, the reaction can be multiplied by a factor, and I would multiply delta H by the same factor. So for example, if for every one carbon atom plus oxygen making CO2, I have this much heat released, then if I have two times as much, two carbons making two oxygens, making two CO2s, then I have two times as much heat. So this is a linear relationship. If I have one, it equals this much. If I have two, it equals two times that much. So we can also say that if a reaction is reversed, then the sign of delta H is reversed. So if carbon plus oxygen making CO2 releases 393 kilojoules of heat, then when I reverse it and I say CO2 making carbon plus oxygen, that absorbs 393.5 kilojoules of heat. So if the, re if the reaction runs this way forward, negative 393, Backwards, positive 393. So if I flip a reaction, I can flip the number of delta H. If I multiply a reaction, I can multiply. If I flip a reaction, I can change the sign. So back to enthalpy being a state function. A state function means I can calculate it in different ways, different paths, and I'll always get to the same change in enthalpy. I'll always have the same change in altitude, regardless of which path I take. So one way that we can take advantage of that is by using uh, what we call Hess's Law. So Hess's Law is going to show me that for different reactions that involve reactants and products that I'm interested in, I can multiply those reactions together to, to form a different path. And when I form a different path, I can get to the reaction I'm looking for. And I can calculate the delta H, the state function of delta H, by taking a different path, by looking at different reactions that aren't actually the reaction I'm uh, interested in at the moment. So before we get there, let's, take, let's look at one more thing, the standard state. The standard state of a material is defined as a set of conditions. So we've already looked at this a little bit. When we were talking about gases, we talked about STP. STP is the standard temperature and pressure. When we're talking about gases, we define a, a state. What is the state that we're going to compare all gases in? Well, it'll be STP, 0 degrees Celsius and 1 atmosphere pressure. Those are standard temperature and standard pressure. So if we're going to start comparing different reactions and different looking at heat across different reactions and reactants and products, then it helps for, it for the same reason to define a standard state. Because if, I'm, if, two different if two different scientists are doing reactions on oxygen, 
and they're having coming to two different results, they're having two different numbers from the same reactions, then they might think that there's there's something uh, there's some problem with their interpretation of the reaction. But maybe what's really happening is that one of them is starting with a small amount and one of them is starting with a large amount or one of them is starting at, at low temperature and one of them is starting at high temperature. If the conditions aren't exactly the same, then two scientists doing the experiment can't compare their numbers because their numbers won't be exactly the same. So in order for scientists to be able to compare their numbers when they're doing experiments, we have to define a standard set of conditions. So the standard state is that a pure gas is at exactly one atmosphere. We've talked about that. That's the STP. Um, and the pure solid or liquid in its most stable form at exactly one atmosphere pressure and the temperature of interest. So um, a standard state means that if we're talking about a gas, it's a pure gas and there's one atmosphere. If we're talking about a pure solid or liquid, then we're talking about um, the most stable form of that pure element. So we'll get to, we have to look at the periodic table to determine if it's going to be a, a solid, a liquid, or a gas. And when we're talking about substances in solution, it's one molar. So standard state is one atmosphere, pure solids or liquids, or substances in aqueous solution, it's one molar. So another way of looking at this is for gases, we're talking about one atmosphere. For solids and liquids, we're talking about the most stable form of that uh, pure solid or liquid uh, at a temperature of interest. So the temperature is not necessarily defined in the standard state. We're talking more about the form of these chemicals. And substances in solution, these are a Q, aqueous. So depending on when we look at a chemical reaction, if we see G or S or L or AQ, then I know what I'm what which of these standard state conditions apply. So the standard enthalpy change is delta H with this little symbol, the little degree symbol after it. So the standard enthalpy change is the enthalpy change when all reactants and products are in their standard state. So again, two different researchers are doing reactions and they're trying to measure um, enthalpy. They're trying to measure the amount of heat released in a reaction. Well, if, they are, uh, if their gases are at more higher or lower pressures, or they are using a different form of the solid or liquid, or if their aqueous solutions are at a higher or lower concentration, then their delta H is gonna be different because delta H is based on the amount of stuff that you use. So in order for two different scientists to compare their numbers when they're doing the same kinds of reactions, we define a standard state, and then we can define a standard enthalpy change. So delta H is the enthalpy change that you get in a reaction when all of the reactants and products are in their standard state. So when we look up reaction, when we look up a list of values on a table, usually we're looking up a list of values that are in their standard state. The standard enthalpy of formation is the enthalpy change for the reaction forming one mole of a pure compound from its constituent elements. Their elements must be in their standard states as well. So when I'm talking about the enthalpy change, I'm talking about the enthalpy of a reaction. So again, that's that this 2044 number that we looked at before. Oops, this number here. This is the enthalpy of reaction. It takes one of these, five of these, three of these, and four of these, and then I get this number, delta H, for the whole reaction. Delta H formation is the heat that's associated when I form one mole of a compound. So there's heat associated with every reaction. I can write any chemical reaction, any chemical equation, and there's a heat associated with that chemical equation. It either absorbs heat or it releases heat when the reaction occurs. So when we're talking about enthalpy of formation, we're talking about specifically a specific type of chemical reaction. And we can measure an enthalpy for any reaction. Enthalpy of formation is the reaction when one mole of a pure compound is formed from its constituent elements. So it's, uh, it's a 
it's they're all different types of heat of reaction this one is specifically talking about the formation of one mole of a pure compound so we'll look at that um, when we're uh, when we're looking at tables of eight of heats here in a moment so all elements the delta H the, del the heat of formation for a pure element in its standard state equals zero so what that means is that um, an, ele an element like oxygen on Earth right now, during the day or during the night, when we find oxygen on Earth, it is in the form of O2 and it is a gas. Because of the temperature and the pressure and all the conditions here on Earth, oxygen exists as O2 and it exists as a gas. So O2 um, O2 a pure oxygen is an element. Oxygen is O. But oxygen in its most stable form at exactly one atmosphere pressure and 25 degrees C equals O2 gas. So this is the most stable form of oxygen on Earth. It's not O1, it's O2. So the formation of O2 takes zero kilojoules per mole and the basis for that is by saying that any any the the form of any compound as it currently exists on earth it must be um, at its lowest energy state to currently be that way so oxygen doesn't exist as O1 because that's a high energy state it exists as O2 because that's a low energy state so the way that we find elements on Earth right now at one atmosphere pressure and 25 degrees C, we call that their standard state, and that takes zero kilojoules per mole. That's their heat of formation for any pure element. Now, for H2O, it does not equal zero, because H2O is not a pure element. H2O has hydrogen and oxygen. So for compounds, it's not equal to zero. It's only equal to zero for elements. It has to be a pure element, like oxygen. OK, here's a table of heat of formation. So to make um, bromine, uh, bromine gas, because bromine uh, at one atmosphere pressure and 25 degrees C is usually a liquid. So Br2 liquid is the, is the most common, most stable form of bromine on Earth, so to form it is zero. It's at the lowest energy state. If I wanted to form bromine 1, like O1, um, if, then I would have to pull these two bromine atoms apart, and I'd have to turn them into a gas. To do that, it takes energy. So if I start here and Br2 is the most stable form and it's at zero, then if I want to pull them apart and turn it into a gas, that's going to take about 112 kilojoules per mole. If I want to turn Br2 into HBr, uh, and I want to take one of those bromines away and add it to an H, that's going to release 36 kilojoules of heat. So this is even lower in energy than Br2 is, because the, it's negative. It's going to release energy to make HBr from Br2. So you can see Br2 is the most stable form, zero. Calcium solid, this is a pure element, zero. Calcium oxide, not a pure element, not zero. Carbon, pure, zero. Carbon, pure, in a different form, not zero. So pure carbon is graphite in its most stable form. Pure carbon, when it's diamond, is not the most stable form. So that takes 1.88 kilojoules per mole of energy to turn graphite into diamond. So if I turn graphite into CO gas, that releases 110.5 kilojoules per mole of energy. So fluorine is not F1, is not the most stable form. F2 is the most stable form, equal to zero. HF equals zero. So you can look at this table and get an idea of um, the, the heat of formation for different compounds. And for some compounds, the heat of formation is very negative. It releases a lot of energy to make this. And for some compounds, the heat of formation is very positive, and it absorbs a lot of energy to make it. Um, here's an example of one that's pretty positive, 142, to make O3, to make ozone. 
So you can see that the heat of formation making different compounds from their constituent elements either releases energy or it absorbs energy or if they're already their most stable it doesn't do anything it's already at zero. So reactions of elements in their standard state to form one mole of a pure compound of their most standard most stable form delta HF equals zero. So to write a formation reaction, if I wanted to write this reaction, I write it from its constituent elements. How do I make CO gas? Well, I need one C and I need one O. C plus O makes CO. If I want to make, uh, uh, oh, this is the, uh, this is the um, atom combination. So there's different kinds of enthalpy. This kind of reaction is called the reaction of atom combination. So that's where I just take the number of atoms that I need and I stick them together. Um, if I want to make an enthalpy of formation uh, equation to use some of these values on the table, generally I have to use those elements in their most sta um, stable state. So this is possible to write a reaction where I just have a C plus an O making CO. But I know that oxygen doesn't come one O at a time. So if I'm going to use the values on the table to generate a, a reaction to use delta H of formation, I have to use the elements in their most stable form. So carbon, its most stable form is solid graphite. Oxygen, its most stable form is O2 gas. So this is called um, a formation reaction. It's different than an atom combination. Formation reaction. So atom combination, I can use the, just an atom, even if it's not the most stable state. And in a formation reaction, I have to use those elements in their most stable state. So C, graphite, oxygen, O2, gas. <laughs> Excuse me. So um, this is not balanced. I have two oxygens on this side and one oxygen on this side. So whenever I'm making a formation reaction, I always have to make one mole of the product. It has to be one mole of product. So this is kind of a uh, contradiction to what we said before about balancing reactions. Since I'm now forced to make only one mole of product, I can only make only one mole. That means that sometimes I have to put fractions over here. Because normally to balance this reaction, what would I do? I'd put a two over here, right? And then I'd have two oxygens and two O's over here. But I'm not allowed to put that two because I can only have a one over here. I can only have one product, one mole of product on this side. So if I'm not allowed to put the two, then what should I do instead? Put a half over here. Because then I'll have one carbon, half of O2 is one oxygen, and one carbon plus one oxygen makes CO. So sometimes formation reactions look funky because they do have fractions. And the reason is because we impose this requirement that this has to be one. And if this has to be one, sometimes these have to be fractions. Oops. All right, let's look at a Hess's law problem. So a problem looks like this. It says, here's two equations. I'm trying to calculate the heat of reaction for this equation down here. I have the heat of reaction for these two equations, but I don't have the heat of reaction for this one down here. So how do I get that information from these two reactions? How do I turn it into this down here? So Hess's law is um, a way that we can add two reactions together, like arithmetic, like two plus two equals four. So I'm gonna add this reaction and this reaction together, and I'm gonna make this reaction down here. <coughs> because you can see, the reason I can do that is because here's F2 and here's F2. So I need F2 in my, the reaction that I'm interested in, and I have F2 up here. 
So there's one reactant. Here's another one. I need H2O. Well, here's H2O. I have those are match. So I can use that information. I need HF. I have HF up here in this one in the reactions I know. I need O2. I have O2. So I have all the ingredients that I need down here. I have all those ingredients up here in, in the reactions that I do know because I have these values, but I don't have this value. So how do I turn these into this? The way that we do that is by um, using those properties that we talked about before, that I can multiply a reaction by 2, and then I would multiply its delta H by 2. Or I can flip a reaction around and make it go this way. And if I make it go this way, then I change the sign from negative to positive. So let's see what I mean. I need F2 as a reactant. I have F2 as a reactant. But I need two F2s as a reactant, and I only have one F2 as a reactant up here. So how do I turn one into two? Well, I have to multiply this reaction by two times two. If I do that, then I'm going to get generate something like this. 2H2 is 2 times 1. And then 2 times 1 here. So plus 2F2. And then here, 2 times 2, 4HF gas. And then what I have to do is I have to multiply this by 2 times 2. So whatever I do to the equation over here, I have to do that to the delta H over here. All right, so let's see what I've done. Now I have 2F2 gas is what I need. And now I have 2F2 gas as a reactant. All right, check. Now I need 2H2O liquid. Make sure you check the state, liquid versus gas. That's important. I need 2H2O liquid as a reactant. I have 2H2O liquid, but this is a product. This plus this makes H2O. So H2O is a product in this reaction. I need H2O as a reactant. How do I do that? Flip the reaction around, make it go backwards. How do I make it go backwards? We multiply by negative 1. So if I multiply this reaction by negative 1, then I flip it. Then it goes 2 H2O liquid. It was a product, now it's my reactant goes to H2 gas plus O2 gas. So just to make, just so that we're not confused, let's cross these out and say, okay, I've already dealt with that. Now I've generated these new equations down here, so I don't need those old equations. I multiply this by negative 1, and the, oh, I forgot my 2. I had two H2s here. Oops. 2H2s were reactants, now 2H2s are products. 2H2Os were products, now 2H2Os are, re are reactants. I just flipped it around. Remember, whatever I do to the reaction, I have to do to the delta H. So this one I multiplied by 2, I multiply delta H by 2. This one I had to flip it around, so I multiply it by negative 1, so I multiply delta H by negative 1. Now let's see, I, I need 2H2O as reactant. I have 2H2O as reactant. All right, check. I need 4HF gas as product. I have 4HF gas as product. All right, check. I need 1O2 gas as product. I have 1O2 gas as product. All right, so in flipping that one around, I did both of those. But wait a minute, I have H2 gas and H2 gas here, but I don't have H2 gas in the reaction I'm looking for. That's not an ingredient that I need in my reaction. So isn't the presence of this thing going to throw off our calculations? Well, if I have an two H2 gases as reactants here in this reaction, and here two H2 gases as products because they're the products of this reaction over here, well, we've seen this before when we were looking at spectator ions. When something appears as a product and a reactant, the same thing, then they can get canceled out. So 2H2 gas reactant, 2H2 gas product, those cancel. What do I have left? 
well, I have 2F2, 2H2O, 4HF, and 1O2. Just the ingredients that I was looking for in my reaction down here. So after I manipulated these equations up here and doubled this one and flipped this one around, I was able to generate the reaction that I was looking for because really what I was doing was like adding them together. This plus this, this reaction plus this reaction equals this reaction down here. So how do I, how do I find what I'm actually looking for, which is this number, delta H of the reaction? Well, now let's uh, plug these numbers in and do this math. I have to take negative 546.6 times 2. That gives me negative delta H reaction standard state equals negative 1,093.2 kilojoules per mole. Now this one is all I have to do times negative 1 delta H reaction standard state equals plus 571.6 kilojoules per mole. Just change the sign. So now to generate this down here, delta H of reaction down here, all I have to do is add these two together. So delta H reaction. Sometimes I'll do it like this. I'll say this is delta H reaction 1. This is delta H reaction 2. This is delta H reaction 3. So delta H reaction 3 just equals delta H reaction 1 plus delta H reaction 2. So let's see, negative 1093.2 plus 571.6 equals negative 521.6 kilojoules per mole. So all we're really interested in in these problems generally is this number. It's just asking you delta H of reaction 3. But you see the way that we get to this number is by actually manipulating these equations. I double the equation. I flip this equation around because I'm trying to, to get to this equation down here. And once I've changed these so that after I cancel out things that are alike on the reactant and product side and I get the reaction I'm looking for, then I know what I have to do to these numbers. Times this one by 2, multiply this one by negative 1, add this to this, and that's my number. All right, here's another question. It says, calculate delta H of reaction for this equation. So if we were given other equations like I was in the last problem, I was given two equations, and I was given their delta H of reaction, then I could use Hess's law and I could rearrange those equations so that I could generate this one right here and then I would have this H of reaction. But in this case it's not saying that I can do that because I didn't, it didn't give me, this question doesn't give me any other reactions. So I can generate delta H reaction 3, let's call it, by doing what we just did. Delta H reaction 1 plus delta H reaction 2. Let's call that, this is Hess's law. A lot of S's. All right, so there's another way I can calculate delta H of reaction. That's by taking, oops, the sum of the delta H formation reactants Oops, I forgot a letter here, times there, times n, minus the sum of, I forgot it again, n times delta hf formation products. Actually, I did that backwards. This should be products minus reactants. So this is 
this letter here, sigma, capital sigma, that means the sum of. So um, products, sometimes I have more than one product. Oh, let's just look at the reaction I have up here. So in this, I have two products, CO2 and H2O. So the sum of the products just means that I have to add this one and this one. And if I had three products, I'd have to add that one and that one and the third one. So the sigma just means the sum of, add them all together. The little n is talking about the stoichiometric coefficient. So what's HF formation of CO2? Well, I have to multiply that by n, which in this case is 5. And here, what's the heat of formation de delta HF of H2O? I look it up in a table, and then I have to multiply it by n, which is 6. And then I'll add this to this. That's what sum means. So I'll do that for the product side. I do 5 times the heat of formation of CO2 plus 6 times the heat of formation of H2O. That's this whole term. Minus, do the same thing to the reactant side. Minus the heat of formation of this times 1, plus the heat of formation of this times 8. So let's write that whole thing out. Delta H reaction equals the sum of the products. So this is going to be... Uh, 5 times the heat of formation of CO2. Let me put that in parentheses. Plus 6 times the heat of formation of H2O. All right, so that's this term right here. Minus. That's this same minus right here. Start the other side. My reactants are this C5H12 and this. So minus 1 times the heat of formation of C5H12 plus 8 times the heat of formation of oxygen, O2. So I can calculate the heat of reaction using Hess's law like we just did. We flip around the equations, we add together the heat of reaction 1 and heat of reaction 2, and we get that. Or I can, gener I can calculate the heat of reaction using this equation, using the heat of formation of reactants and products. So now this is what this looks like after I apply it to this equation. Products first, minus reactants. Now I have to look up these numbers in a table. So we have that table right here. All right, so um, of course I chose one that's not in this table. Let's look up the ones that are in this table. <coughs> um, HF of CO2 gas. We have to make sure that we find the right uh, phase. So CO2 gas negative 393.5 so this is negative 393.5 kilojoules per mole times 5 plus let's look this one up H2O gas Oh, H2O gas and H2O liquid, so you got to make sure that you know the state. So H2O gas, negative 241.8. Oops. Negative 241.8 kilojoules per mole. Minus, this is the one that is not in the table, C5H12. I don't have that in my table here, so I'm going to Google it. Heat of formation C5H12. Heat of formation for, well, it's C5H12, pentane, yep, that's right, okay. 
negative 146.8 kilojoules per mole. Negative 146.8 kilojoules per mole plus 8 times oxygen. I'm running out of room, but I think I'm going to have enough because oxygen, zero. O2 gas is the most stable form of oxygen, and a pure element, the HF of a pure element is zero. So for that one, 8 times zero. Anytime I have a pure element, like O2, its heat of formation is equal to zero. So now I've just got to plug all this stuff into the calculator. So negative 393.5 times 5 is negative 19675 kilojoules per mole. 6 times negative 241.8 is plus negative 1450.8 kilojoules per mole minus negative 146.8 kilojoules per mole plus zero. All right, so a lot of negatives here. Negative and a negative, that should make the negative get bigger, right? So 19675 negative plus 1450.8 negative is negative 21125.8 kilojoules per mole. Minus a negative is actually plus, right? So then if I say minus 146.8 and make it negative, then this number 146.8 should get bigger, excuse me, should become less negative. So finally, after all that, delta H reaction equals negative 20,979 kilojoules per mole. So to, to find delta H of reaction this way, you look up these heat of formation values in a table, like the table that we have here or the table in your textbook or a table from Google.